how much could I possibly enjoy nonfiction, which is to say completely based in fact and history, nonfiction comics that look like this or this or this or this? And the answer to that is a lot. I enjoy them a lot. If you had asked me when I was young and getting into comics, or even uh, later when I was getting back into comics, if these are the types of comics that would appeal to me, I think I would have been very surprised by the answer that I would give today, which is that these four comics by writer-artist Box Brown are four of the most entrancing comics reads of the last decade for me. In this video, I want to talk a little bit in detail about these four books and why I find them to be such superlative comics. So let's dive right into Four Comics I Love by Box Brown. Although I wouldn't call myself a gamer, I have spent many, many, many hours of my life playing games. And just like with comics, I have often found myself defending games to people not familiar with them, trying to clear up misconceptions or dispel uh, sweeping generalizations about games and people who play them. This video, of course, is not about my relationship with games, be they video games or tabletop games or card games, especially poker, or even puzzles and childhood playground games. Those details would be the subject of a completely different video, probably a completely different channel. But it was because of this love of games that in 2016, I found myself intrigued by a new release from Publishers First Second, a publisher I had recently learned of, a new release that with its title plugged straight into the nostalgia I had for how a lot of this began for me. The title of this comic was Tetris, The Games People Play. And from its online description, I could tell that it was about the birth and the origin of possibly the world's most famous video game. It was written and drawn by someone I'd never heard of, someone with the incredibly direct name of Box Brown. And when I ordered and received it, I sat down and read it in one sitting. This ended up being not just one of my favorite comics reads of that year, but possibly one of my favorite comics of the last decade. Because of Tetris, I began to search for anything else by Box Brown I could find, which at that time was just one other book, Andre the Giant, Life and Legend. This was a comic from 2014, two years before Tetris, and was a biographical account of the famous professional wrestler. Now, if there's anything on the opposite side of the spectrum, as far as my love is concerned, from games, it is probably professional wrestling, something I've never enjoyed and never gotten into. Still, because of how good Tetris was and because I was familiar with Andre the Giant from the movie The Princess Bride, I ordered this book and I found that I loved it almost as much as I loved Tetris. Once I'd finished this, I had to sit around and wait for more Box Brown. Box Brown's next book was published in 2018, which meant I had to wait two years for is this guy for real, the unbelievable Andy Kaufman. I'd actually started this channel by then, so this comic did show up in one of my recent reads and new acquisitions videos. And last year, 2019, brought another Box Brown nonfiction comic to my shelves and my collection, and another feature in one of my recent reads and new acquisitions in the form of cannabis, the illegalization of weed in America. Between cannabis, Andy Kaufman, Andre the Giant, and Tetris. Box Brown has covered subject matter that goes from some things I'm very interested in to things that I'm not at all interested in, things or people I have a little bit of knowledge about. And what has really united all four of these books for me is the way that he makes all of these stories exciting and interesting and at the same time heartbreaking and humane. Box Brown's interest in the facts are not limited to only the particular story he's telling. He seems to take in, like most great nonfiction writers do, contexts that have to do with the world and the situation around the stories that he's interested in, giving you as a reader full knowledge and full context in a way that you would not have believed 
if possible. But also I would think if you're an expert in uh, the particular subject that he's talking about, he illuminates it with things that you may not have considered connected to them. In order to demonstrate for you exactly what I mean, what I like to do is to go through these books one by one and pick out four or five things that really stand out for me and make Box Brown such an amazing comics writer artist. Let's start with the book that started it all for me, even though it wasn't the earliest work of these four, Tetris, The Games People Play. One of the first, most superficial things to note about Box Brown is that his subtitles aren't just throwaway or merely decorative. They are very crucial to the story that he's interested in. So, for example, Tetris is not just about Tetris, it is about the games people play, as we'll soon see. I have to admit that when I first got this book and looked at the boxy art, I was a little worried if I had uh, picked something a little too simplistic, maybe something that was basic. But very, very quickly that faded. As soon as I started reading it, not only did the art style not matter from the point of view of uh, dissuading me that uh, this is not something complex, it in fact accentuated how how easily I was able to get the story that Box Brown wanted to tell me. For example, on this page, there's this panel right in the middle of them racing to the end of the street. If you took this panel just by itself, you might not think that it's very sophisticated. But as part of this page with this dialogue exchange, this brief action, this huffing and puffing and catching up and this conclusion that you're a true artist, uh, that's why you couldn't keep up, is... Uh, is, is perfect. I mean, you get this moment, you get this vignette in a way that many more sophisticated looking art uh, does not get it across to you, I think. So Tetris starts with Alexei and Vladimir in Moscow working at the computer center of uh, the Academy of Science. And then on his walk home, Alexei continues to consider the earth, its human inhabitants, art and the games they play. Then this story goes off into southwestern France 17,000 years ago and cave paintings. And then you've got this narrative uh, about cave paintings, about how they showed not just animals in daily life, but humans engaged in wrestling and running races and depictions of sport, etc., etc. We have some questions that come up. Do games come from a sense of competition, this fighting spirit? Is this where games first started? And this, just a few pages in, although we started with Alexei and Vladimir, a few pages in, maybe games aren't just an outgrowth of human competition. Maybe games were born from artists' imaginations. This is where the book hooked me. Through its discussion of art defining humanity and art creating games, as quote-unquote simple as these four panels might look per page, as simple as these kind of expressions might seem to us, this comic started bringing home how significant games would be culturally to humankind for me in a way that I hadn't seen before. I think many comics readers have found Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics to be such a fascinating read because it almost justifies their passion for comics. It makes it sound like, oh, I always knew this. I just didn't have the vocabulary. And this, just these first few pages of Tetris works the same way, I think, for people who like games. It starts giving you not just historical, but artistic context and asking questions, all actually coming from uh, the thoughts of Alexei way back over here on the first a couple of pages as he's walking home. We don't know if these are ruminations that are in his mind or if it's the author's research and the author's questions, and it really doesn't matter. They're so perfectly merged together, but like understanding comics does for comics, this creates the sensation of 
I knew it. I knew games were important. I knew they had uh, a role to play in human culture. And there's a reason why we are so attracted to them. And I at least started feeling very, very grateful for this book, putting it across in the very clear, very simple and almost inarguable way that it does. So we've got a history of games, including Senate, discussion on the prefrontal cortex and where higher order thinking is taking place and how these games are plugging directly into that. Even when players, as it says over here, aren't aware that they're doing anything special, they just seem to be satisfying themselves, they're just having fun, games could be making you better at managing your daily life. This section ends in a really funny way by saying, even the most dedicated player who has their custom dice and custom dice bag, who never smiles and focuses only on strategy, whether they know it or not, is in the pursuit of fun. Just like the first section, the next section starts with a character introduction in a little box, this time of the founder of Nintendo, Yamauchi, and a history of this company that started off with playing cards and card games and why they were so popular compared to the card games uh, that were already available. Once again, four simple looking panels, very simple sentences, packs in a lot. This time about the history of gambling, in Japan and how cards were used. Then we're introduced to Gunpei Yokoi and Hiroshi Yamauchi, the president and chairman of Nintendo and a factory engineer and toy inventor. And this history of Nintendo for a Nintendo fan like me was an incredible read. And this, I think, is a great example of Box Brown's genius. The way he uses comics vocabulary to show you the creation of ideas. The way he uses comics and cartoon vocabulary to show you basic exchanges that are actually quite significant. And over and over again, you keep getting new sections with new characters, new businesses, and new stories. Now about coin-op machines, now about arcade games. Shigeru Miyamoto is introduced. The idea of designing a game for a machine that already exists. All of these things are happening in a tangent from Alexei and Vladimir, who we've only seen for a couple of pages right at the beginning. But what this does by setting up Nintendo and the history of games in Japan and the company and the technology is tell you what's going on in the world around these two scientists who are uh, sort of sequestered in Moscow in the height of the Cold War. We come back to Alexei. And again, thought, imagination, processing, what he thinks about games is presented very similarly to the way that we saw Gunpei, for example, back here creating ideas for Nintendo. This kind of subtle echoing and connecting people all over the world uh, through the comics vocabulary is one of the things I think Box Brown does very well, but very unflashily. You don't have to actually see this as a mirror of this, for example. You don't have to see this psychology and emotion bifurcation as a mirror of the cognitive stuff that we saw earlier with uh, ancient Egyptians, for example. But these simple, almost diagrammatic expressions are working really well to get across to you, the reader, the idea of challenge, reward, discovery, frustration, and closure, the building blocks of games. Having established games and puzzles, we are now filled in on Alexei's day job at the center in Moscow and how he started programming in his favorite puzzles into the computer. And over here, something that could have been extremely technical and jargon filled, uh, especially for someone like me, is presented as if to a child. It is so clear primarily because Box Brown uses the perfect balance of text and image. You never have huge paragraphs, you only have one sentence, player manipulating them as they fell. Alexei went into a programming fury. Only text characters. Alexei was able to assemble the glass. 
And the design again is so elegant. We know that we're seeing four or maybe six panels. So when we see a large panel like this, we automatically know that it's important. And of course it is. This is where he changes from five squares to four squares, allowing Tetris to be programmed. The fact that a moving video game being programmed is being shown to you on static pages in a comic book form, perfectly done by Box Brown, is really what makes this book so excellent to me. This may look simple, this rotation may look simple, this dropping may look simple, the line cleared might look overly cartoonish, but there's no doubting uh, what's going on over here, and there's no doubting just in the way that the games are creating a connection with the human brain that this page and these panels are creating a connection with us as comics readers. And this is what I mean. It doesn't matter that the faces look like this. It doesn't matter that the shapes look like this, not very complex or not with a lot of lines. In fact, this is what starts affecting us just in the way that Tetris is such a deceptively simple game that has this incredible addictive nature to it. This book has got you hooked. You are following along effortlessly. And it takes its time explaining to you why it's having the effect that it is on all of the colleagues of Alexi who are trying this game out on their computers, how no one can stop playing it, how they're getting more and more addicted to it, and how through the form of floppy disks it spreads throughout Moscow with the computer center as the epicenter of this. Within two weeks, Tetris was on every computer in Moscow. Alexei's story continues with him continuing to work at the center, but then we have the entry of yet another character, Robert Stein from Andromeda Software. Throughout this book, characters are introduced. So for example, here we are introduced to more people, the more software companies that become interested in Tetris, just like Robert Stein right here. This is the Robert Stein section. This is the other software companies section. At the height of the Cold War, the curiosity about Russia, how, what kind of a role it plays in this interest in this game is given to us in three very effective panels, chess, hockey, Rocky IV. The idea of the first USSR game being released in the United States being a marketing godsend, using even Reagan and Gorbachev in their advertising. These are just fascinating little glimpses and vignettes that the book continues to put in front of us, building block by block, brick by brick, this story of Tetris. Over here, I think one of the most miraculous things for me as a reader was the kind of tension that negotiating rights creates. This story gets very complex, but never convoluted. The number of characters who are introduced is mitigated by when they're introduced, when they need to play a role in this story. We are always clear about who is doing what and why, and we are getting caught up in the dizzy nature of these negotiations and this jockeying for power and for rights. And yet it's anchored in a lovely way using Alexei and eventually Hank, who travels from the United States to meet him. Alexei's joy in games and loving what he has created and being so proud of it and wanting to share it with people stands in a direct contrast with all of the businessmen and the companies who are trying to cash in on this fantastic opportunity. This is one of my favorite panels uh, where he poses for the video camera of Hank and it's another one of those large panels where unlike in most places, Places. He's given this slight halo edge all around by Box Brown, this one picture him saying play Tetris. I found this panel extremely affecting and one of the human anchors of this crazy story. Even at the end of this book, there are some incredible twists and turns in including one um, absolutely inexplicable tragedy, but all of it is woven in with such delicacy because Box Brown is so in charge of the vocabulary that he's using. His pacing is impeccable. His presentation of which moment, which character, which line of dialogue, which quoted speech, which paraphrase speech is so good that he can have pages like this that look simple but are actually quite complex. He's telling you a very dense story and you don't even recognize it. Next up, Andre the Giant, Life and Legend.
Under the Giant subtitle is Life and Legend. And once again, the subtitle is important because as Box Brown explains right at the beginning that there are so many stories that are purely anecdotal, that are stories that people tell about each other without any written record, obviously, but also the fact that in professional wrestling, so much is about storytelling, so much is about building a legend that... There might be things that aren't absolutely true, but he does have citations of where he's getting that story from. It's really about good faith storytelling. And even though, as I said, I have had never any interest in professional wrestling, I found myself captivated by the story of this gentle giant. But what was also interesting about this story is that Andre the Giant is presented warts and all, as the blurbs uh, often say. Whether it's drugs, alcohol, uh, women, prostitutes, they're all presented presented over here, but the gentleness of his spirit and the peaceful nature almost of a person who still liked to fight a lot is wonderfully put across. Like Tetris giving you context about the Cold War and Nintendo and uh, Japanese, American and Russian history, Andre the Giant gives you an idea about professional wrestling. This is the book that introduced me to the concept of kayfabe. And there are sections of this book that dissect a fight from the point of view of the performance of what is trying to be shown to the audience. This book is full of powerful moments like when Andre uses a racial slur and is confronted by a fellow wrestler when he receives an injury and it's presented in such a matter of fact way that you really admire the clear eyed storytelling that Box Brown is doing over here. Once again, I was really surprised to find how how much complexity there is in something that looks simple. You've got a variety of styles and techniques being used within this form. You've got travel across the world shown in pages like this. You've got fights and violence depicted in uh, bone crunching impact. You've got diagrammatic representations that quickly tell you who's who of a wide variety of colorful characters from professional wrestling and also depictions of Andre's condition worsening and the impact it has on his body. There are a number of great moments in this book, some of them just uh, an interview with David Letterman that slowed down to the conversation going question by question, a fight with Hulk Hogan that has been perfectly choreographed to sort of pass the mantle from uh, the old school champion to the modern hero. And unlike Tetris, since I had no interest in professional wrestling, what I found most impressive about this book is that it made me understand and uh, the form, which is that the audience is part of the storytelling in professional wrestling, how their involvement uh, is very much like comics. It needs to have that level of activity, unlike, say, movies, which are very passive. In that weird way, professional wrestling is much closer to comics than movies are. I had never thought of it that way, and at least for something like that, I have to give due credit to Box Brown and Andre the Giant. Next up... Is this guy for real? The unbelievable Andy Kaufman. Is this guy for real? That unbelievable Andy Kaufman, I thought would be a variation on what I saw in the Miloš Forman movie with Jim Carrey, uh, Man on the Moon. And, and certainly there are a lot of overlaps of moments, uh, famous as well as infamous, uh, that are shared between the movie and the book. But the book actually starts with young Andy watching television. First, it's Mighty Mouse, then he changes the channel. It's Elvis Presley, he changes the channel. It's professional wrestling. And of course, all of these things weren't happening on the same day, but I thought it it was a superb uh, method to introduce you to the influences on this young kid's mind and also uh, where his performances come from. Because the one thing that this book does, I think, very well is convince me that Andy Kaufman was some sort of a genius. He Anything he tried, anything he gave himself to, he would excel at it. Sometimes to such a level that people did not realize what was happening. Over here, for example, uh, he sees a musician play the drums at school assembly, gets absolutely fascinated by it, and 
later on he becomes a bongo congo drum expert himself in spite of what i knew about andy kaufman from that movie i found this book to be an absolute revelation because the lines that it connects between professional wrestling elvis presley stand-up comedy the performance of an accented foreigner all of these things are blurring the lines between what is reality and what is fiction and andy kaufman's fascination with manipulating the audience giving them what they're looking for, getting them to enjoy something is is incredible. He understood that wrestling needs a bad guy. He understood that uh, people hating him in one way was actually a success of performance. These are complex ideas at the best of times, but the fact that Box Brown is able to take this series of vignettes over and over again, give us moments, give us exchanges and lines of dialogue, entire scenes and performances that connect for us a notion of who this person is, what they were interested in, why they were the way they were, is really impressive. Again, like in Tetris, you can see that the format of reading the page is often messed with. You can see that juxtaposition and recall and echoing and mirroring uh, helps contribute to this. There are themes and motifs that keep coming back even as the story progresses and gets more outlandish, but none of this is really Really in your face. And this is where I think Box Brown really excels. I think, again, to get back to Scott McLeod, what he does very well is amplification through simplification. Because it's simple, because there is nothing else other than what he wants to look at, it's as if he has reduced everything to just the purest essence of what he wants to talk about and his storytelling happens almost as if you're mainlining it as a drug with nothing else standing between you and the story. At the end of the story, Box Brown himself appears as a character in conducting interviews and getting opinions and ends with an anecdote which messes with time by going back into the past once we've reached what we think is the end of the story. I really enjoyed this end. I thought it was heartbreaking and and beautiful and even though I had enjoyed the movie the fact that um, Andy's brother said that the movie presented him as sort of a buffoon made me feel bad because I didn't think so but I now feel that compared to this book uh, yes perhaps the movie in spite of uh, having a very you know, in, in spite of having a fantastic director and a fantastic performance, doesn't quite do the character of Andy Kaufman justice the way that this book does. And the final book for today is Cannabis, The Illegalization of Weed in America. Like the other books that we've looked at, Cannabis was an extremely surprising book, primarily because of all the things it taught me that I didn't know, but right at the beginning, because it starts not with the United States, even though the subtitle is The Illegalization of Weed in America, it starts in India. It starts with a Hindu creation myth, that of the churning of the ocean, and it's very beautifully and elegantly done. Even though I'm familiar with the myth, this was uh, a very refreshing take on it. And what I did not know, even though I was aware that this was where uh, these gods and goddesses, jewels, a wish-fulfilling tree, that this is where they came from. What I did not know is that this is apparently where cannabis came from and this is why it was so revered in India, why it was consumed by holy men, the sadhus, the ascetics, and why devotees of the god Shiva consume it. I knew it's popular but I did not know it was so popular that the British actually investigated and were worried for a while, worried that hemp was everywhere and they tried their hardest to prove that it was extremely dangerous and should be outlawed but nothing in their research Research and nothing in their investigations found that to be the case. After experiments and interviews, they had to conclude that it was perfectly safe, but of course they took that as an ethical grounds to be able to tax it. This beginning of the book with a Hindu myth was quite surprising to me because uh, I was expecting it to be the story of the illegalization of weed in America. And once again, the subtitle is very important because this book is about the illegalization 
realization about the long and systematic and often unbelievable process of making marijuana illegal in the United States. But that's why I wasn't expecting to start with India. Although actually it starts with a rather abstract exploration or um, a, a sort of imaginary exercise to say that what must it have been like for the first person to get high, even though we don't know who that was, what happened to that pioneer? What did they do? What was their experience? And by presenting it this way with an anonymous, even for this simpler, rounder style, a completely anonymous figure talking about marijuana in a general sense, some users can become paranoid. This can be accompanied by hallucinations. Whatever their experience, it only lasted a few hours. This pioneer slept, their nightmares dulled, and this went on for thousands of years. This is a fantastic way of giving you not just history, but an introduction to cannabis, marijuana, and its symptoms for people who may not be familiar. Then we have the myth of the churning of the ocean, and and you're just about wondering what this is doing in this book when you move to 1518 with Cortez invading Mexico to claim it for Spain. Now the story is set in the Americas. We've seen this elegant, lean and matter of fact style before in the other comics and Box Brown quickly fills us in to the fact that consuming um, hallucinogenics like peyote or mushrooms was already something that people were familiar with. So consuming marijuana wasn't something extremely out of left field. The use of it in Mexico gives it a bad reputation in the United States. But I also learned about how migrant labor working in farmlands and working next to black people, uh, freed slaves and sharecroppers, meant that they had this cultural exchange and the spread of the use of marijuana within a certain group of people meant that another group of people, the richer white people, now grew more and more afraid of this. This was associated with the lower classes. It was associated with lesser people. And this is actually something that creates a slight connection uh, to what we'd seen right at the beginning where you had a bunch of uh, white British uh, people who were really upset about the use of hemp because alcohol over and over again we see is supposed to be the civilized drug, is supposed to be what uh, civilized people do and marijuana is what the savages, the brown and the black people do. This story is a story of racism and that is perhaps the most impressive thing about this book. It is a complex story to tell and I had no idea about it. I just thought it was a thing about people who do drugs and people who don't do drugs. But this idea that people went after a certain group of people, that stories were created and and myths were created. Unlike this uh, beautiful creation myth that we see over here, myths of violence, myths of depravity coming from the consumption of this drug and how it was linked to a race. These, I think, are extremely complicated sociological things that this comic does so well in explaining to you. The manner in which it puts this across is almost comedic. The way that stories are are exaggerated, the way that things that are absolute fiction are passed off as fact. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Box Brown is publishing this in 2019. This notion of fake news and uh, fake information in order to create fear seems as current today as the story that is being told over here. In particular, how one man through his personal crusade and connections in the government and depending on whose ear he had, was able to affect such important legislation and such incredible changes in laws over a period of time uh, so as to imprison a whole bunch of people and to uh, persecute a whole group of people for something that really doesn't have evidence of being dangerous and harmful uh, was, uh, was astonishing to me. What was also astonishing was the fact that the United States was able to successfully lobby the United Nations into making cannabis or marijuana illegal almost all over the world. 
world. It seems that most countries were just ready to agree that this was a really dangerous thing and it should be illegal. And uh, most of them didn't really care. They had alcohol and tobacco and that was all that was needed. And this is where the book really surprised me because after all this story of what's been happening in the United States, it comes back to India, which was the only country in the United Nations that apparently didn't want to ratify the illegalization of marijuana. They were the only country that stood up to the United States and everyone else who agreed saying that it was part of their culture and was part of the religious belief system and they couldn't just do it. After incredible pressure was put on India, apparently they asked for 50 or 55 years in order to socialize this. And then the book goes back into talking about what's going on in the United States in that period of time and then comes back again to India after 55 years where they make laws saying, okay, this top part of the plant is illegal, but this middle part of the plant is legal if you use it in this way and uh, aren't really that concerned about it. All these things were not just new to me and uh, given to me as information by this book, but were clarified to me with such humor and with such precision because as I said, while reading this book, it almost felt like a comedy. And I think that was the point that Boxer Brown was trying to achieve, was trying to say that the illegalization action is such an outright farce almost that no one could see it as anything else other than comedy, even though all of these things are based in facts and very well researched and given to you with dates and times, it still does feel as if um, someone's making this up. But then again, a lot of things today feel that way, don't they? I think it's fairly obvious that I find Box Brown to be an incredible storyteller. He has a real eye for detail. He knows how to pick and choose the moments and the anecdotes that really bring the story alive. And as I said at the beginning of this video, he really knows how to cast his net wide enough to bring in all these kind of factors that enrich the story beyond what you think it's going to be about. Box Brown has a new book coming out later this year in 2020. From what I can tell, this is his first work of fiction that I'll get to read. This is also published by First Second and it's about uh, child stars in Hollywood. I think it's an amalgamation of a number of true stories but a fictionalized uh, putting together of all of them. I'm always interested when people step outside of what I know them for. I like the fact that Guy Delisle, who I'd known as an autobiographical non-fiction writer, did Hostage, which was someone else's story. I was very excited and happy with Jason's On the Camino, which was the first time I saw him do autobiography from his really uh, weird and uh, out there fiction stories. And Box Brown doing fiction fits very nicely into that kind of category. So I'm very excited about it. Another interesting thing is that the Amazon entries for Box Brown books now say Brian Box Brown within quotation marks, and that's the way his name appears on the cover of this new book. So now I know that his real name is Brian. I hope you enjoyed this examination of four books by a writer artist I really admire. As always, let me know what you think in the comments below and thank you for watching. This has been For the Love of Comics and I'll see you at the next video.